Thank you very much, Mr. Vondervik, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Although I must confess, I'm feeling a little inadequate because I only have words for you. I don't have words and movement like Kiri's introduction, so I apologize in advance that I bring you no dance. Um, but I, I, I mention this because I thought Kiri's introduction was fantastic. And this idea, this question, are we moving forward? is just such an important issue for humanity. And I want to start with a sort of an optimistic thought to begin with. Um, uh, one thing in my biography is I used, worked for many years in the British government. Um, and so I was working on international development when we agreed the Millennium Development Goals. And I think it's important to pause and remember that when those were created, a lot of people, most of us, never thought we were going to get close. Uh, that the MDGs were an aspirational goal, not something we thought we would achieve. And so I think there is something, a point where as we reach the 15 years uh, of their implementation, we should pause and celebrate about how far that we've come. And in a way, this sort of highlights a key issue that the Social Progress Index is thinking about, which is, in a way, the, the reason we've got so far with the MDGs, as we know, is that economic development has been a huge driver. You know, economic development, economic growth has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in places like China and India. So we know that economic development does lead to social progress. But we also know that it doesn't. We know that economic development, you know, is, you know, Tunisia was the superstar of economic development. It was the World Economic Forum, World Bank's favorite country before the Arab Spring. Economic development was not leading to real improvements in people's lives in Tunisia. Or take our own societies before the financial crisis of 2008. We thought we had societies that were going very well, economic growth was booming, but that economic growth turned out to be a mirage. Economic growth can be misleading. And we also know fundamentally that economic growth has a big question mark over it, over its sustainability in the long term. So we know that there's not always this relationship. Economic development doesn't always lead to social progress. And maybe also, social progress can be a really important part of long-term economic growth. So the Social Progress Index was really created to understand this relationship between economic development and social progress in an empirical way. And that was why we created the Social Progress Index. So let me um, uh, begin by just explaining a few design principles. The most important thing to uh, notice about the Social Progress Index is it's based entirely on social and environmental indicators. If you look at other measures such as UN Human Development Index, OECD Better Life Index, Gross National Happiness in Bhutan, they all mix together economic and social indicators. What we've done is separated out the economic, left GDP out of our model, and looked only at social and environmental indicators. And that means, and I'll show you later, we can look at the relationship between GDP and social progress independently to try and understand what this thing called inclusive growth that we all want to get really means. The second thing we've done is we've measured only outcomes. So we're not measuring laws passed, money spent, any inputs. We're only measuring outcomes. And that means that we don't have to make value judgments about which policies are right. We're just measuring what do countries actually achieve. The third thing is we've wanted to make it relevant to all countries, countries from the richest to the poorest. Um, so we've got the whole world on one continuum. Obviously, Human Development Index measures all of them, all the countries in the world, but there's not a lot of texture at the top. So we wanted to get, create a measure that was relevant for every country. And finally, we wanted to drive action. The Social Progress Imperative began with a very similar vision and agenda to Partnership for Change. How do we bring together government, business, civil society to solve the world's biggest problems? So we wanted to create something that was actionable. So that was the, those are the design principles. Um, so all we had to do was define social progress. Well, I think we've been trying certainly since Aristotle to do that. Um, so uh, we won't say we've solved the problem of defining social progress, but here's our measure. So we say that social progress is based on three things. Do people have the basic needs for survival? Food, water, shelter, safety. Secondly, does every individual have the building blocks to improve their lives? Education, information, 
health and a sustainable environment. And then finally, opportunity. Does every individual have the opportunity to pursue their hopes and dreams? Do they have rights, freedom of choice, freedom from discrimination, and access to the world's most advanced knowledge? So that's our hypothesis. These 12 components make up the Social Progress Index. And what we've been doing is we've been testing this hypothesis. We've talked to policymakers. We've talked to economists. We've talked to politicians. We've talked to people in pubs. We've talked to philosophers. And what we get back is this is a pretty reasonable definition of what makes up a good society. So with this definition, we then fill this out with a whole set of 52 different indicators. Now, we don't gather any of the data ourselves. This is all taken from secondary sources. So from the World Bank, the United Nations, uh, experts, uh, some Gallup survey data. And so for each of the 12 components, we've got a set of indicators measuring that for all the countries. And we've able to measure 133 countries using this. Let me just stress, the methodology is published online. All the data is online. It's downloadable. It's fully transparent. So you'll find it all, use it, take it. We're a philanthropically funded organization. So this data is, a, this tool is a global public good. So here's how we make the Social Progress Index. What does it tell us? Well, let me start by showing you how the world does. So every single component of the Social Progress Index is ranked on a scale of 0 to 100. So if you look at the left-hand side, the world scores 61 out of 100 overall, which uh, puts the world somewhere about the same as living in Cuba or Kazakhstan. That's sort of how the world is doing. This is weighted by population, I should say. And then what we can do is we can break down into the 12 components. And let's start with the good news, which is where does the world do best? Nutrition and basic medical care and access to basic knowledge. So two areas that have been a focus of the MDGs, the world is doing pretty well and getting close to 100. So I think we can really talk about there's been a win there for the MDGs. Water and sanitation is a bit behind, and that's probably due to sanitation, I think, in particular, uh, but also above average. Where's the world doing worst? Very interesting. Uh, tolerance and inclusion. And I think it was interesting to hear in the introduction that issues about extremism are being discussed over this conference. Tolerance and inclusion is an issue for countries at all levels of development. Environmental sustainability, not the worst, but one that worries, is very worrying because it tends not to improve with GDP per capita. So that's the world in aggregate. Let's have a look at how we do by country. So here's a map of the world. But what I want to do is show you the Social Progress Index results on this chart. So the vertical axis is social progress index scores. Higher is better. Horizontal axis, GDP per capita, just for fun. Yeah? So GDP is not in the model. I'm just putting it here on the horizontal axis, just for fun, just for comparison. Further to the right is better. OK? So the country in the world with the highest social progress is Norway. I think we should do that one again. I want a round of applause, please. OK, so hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. And so the country in the world with the highest, and cheering as well, cheering as well, maybe a few bit of whooping. Um, so the country in the world with the highest social progress is Norway. <laughs> Congratulations, Mr. Van der Vick. Um, the country in the world with the least social progress, I'm sad to say, is the Central African Republic. Now, what do we notice on this chart? Well, we see that Norway is a lot richer than the Central African Republic. Aha, so economic growth is good for us. Well, let me show you two other countries. Uh, here is New Zealand, almost the same level of social progress as Norway, but with about half the GDP. And here's Malawi, much higher social progress than Central African Republic, but a very similar GDP per capita. So what's going on? Let me just show you a few other highlight countries. Um, Canada is the top of the G7. My country, the UK, is lagging a little further behind. Better than the United States, and more importantly, better than France. Um, amongst the BRICs, we have the top BRIC is Brazil, then South Africa, 
then Russia, then China, and then India. And then over here is Kuwait. That's the big outlier in terms of very high GDP, not so much social progress. And here is the social progress superpower, Costa Rica, the country in the world that's squeezing the most social progress out of its GDP per capita. So that's a few. Let me now pop in the regression line that shows the average relationship. And so let me start here with the good news that this tells us. This tells us that GDP isn't bad for us. It's actually quite good for us. There's a correlation of 0.78 between social progress and GDP. Social progress does tend to improve as GDP rises. And it's really important at the lower levels of the curve for lower level incomes, which kind of makes sense, which is that as countries get a little bit more resource with the right policies, they can reinvest that money in water supply, teachers, doctors, nurses, those kind of things. So you can get a lot of social progress at low income levels for small amounts of extra GDP. But then notice we get this flattening out effect. So for richer countries, there's an issue about each extra dollar of GDP is buying less and less social progress. So that's the good news for GDP. But the other thing that shows us is that GDP is not destiny. At any level of GDP, there are opportunities for higher social progress, risks of less. If we are thinking about our world and trying to de define progress only in terms of GDP, we only have half a plan. You've got to be thinking about social progress as well as GDP. So that's something this tool can do um, because we've separated out GDP and social progress to demonstrate empirically that yes, GDP is good for us, but it's not the whole story. So that's the aggregate story. I want to very quickly just show you how this can help us also understand countries. Because, again, because we have no GDP in the model, we can say, how is a country performing relative to its GDP? So for every country, we take the 15 countries closest in GDP per capita, and then say, are you performing significantly better or worse than that peer group on your aggregate social progress index score, but also on each of the components and indicators? Uh, and so I want to show you Norway. So there's a lot of detail here. So just look at the colors. Obviously, green is good, red is bad, yellow is neutral. So here's Norway, the number one country in the world on social progress. And the scorecard is yellow, largely. So what this is telling us is that, yes, Norway has the highest social progress in the world, yeah, but it's performing about as well as you would expect for a country of this GDP. It's not overperforming. And there are obviously areas for improvement. There are red lights here. So Norway, congratulations on being first in the world on social progress, but there is room for improvement. Um, not as much room for improvement as there is, for just another one to show you, the United States. So this is a very interesting one. Here's a country with very high GDP, pretty high social progress, but relative to its GDP, the US is failing on so many counts. We seem to have lost a column on the right. Um, this is all, these are all on our website, so for every single country. And just for comparison, here's a poor country, Rwanda, which, although it's very poor, relative to its GDP, is achieving a much higher social progress. So this, we see, is a useful tool to help countries at all levels of income understand how well they're performing, understand the priorities for improvement.